So this is a little bit different kind of video, guys. We're going way back in history on this one, man, because uh, I've been doing a lot of videos about the Stones lately, or as they call themselves, the Moes, and I had mentioned a couple times on the channel that uh, that's another name that they go by. And one of my viewers, shout out to him, uh, a couple of videos ago had mentioned uh, that the reason they call themselves the Moes is actually because they're calling themselves Moors. And just a, you know, like a short slang uh, version of the word Moors. So that group uh, that's referred to as the Moors is actually very prominent in Chicago culture, uh, not just gang culture, I mean, culture in general, especially in a lot of the uh, civil rights organizations that started to come out in the 60s. And um, it, you see the symbols, you see a lot of the, uh, the, the terminology and a lot of the, even the dress that the Moors used in a lot of um, groups here in the city and the uh, various movements that they've been involved with. Uh, you, these themes like permeate all these different groups. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about where that comes from in this video. Uh, and you know, I've done a lot of history videos on Chicago, man, but uh, most of those videos have been only going back about 100, 150 years. For this one, we're gonna have to go way back, man, over a thousand years. Some events um, surrounding this, this mysterious group uh, over which there's a lot of debate, um, but which even today, you know, figures very prominently in, uh, in Chicago culture, man. So before I get to that first, why did these groups like the Stones and a lot of these civil rights organizations um, draw on themes and, and terms and culture that the Moors use so much? Well, it was really a counteraction, um, a rhetorical counteraction against white supremacy. Uh, you got to understand, like, the, in the history of this country, um, there was a lot of rationalization, justification, and kind of twisting of history that was involved in basically assuaging the consciences of Americans and uh, making it palatable to Americans to be able to oppress black folks. So if you go all the way back to the beginning of the country, actually even before that, to where America was a series of colonies, uh, the, the type of slavery that they were using at that time was modeled after the slavery that was used by the Hebrews in the Bible. And that was basically what something we would call indentured servitude, which was basically six years of service. And after that, you're free unless the slave chooses to remain a slave. If he chooses, then he can be a slave for, uh, for life. But normally it was only for six years. And then after that, you would have to, to set the person free. And this could be imposed on somebody for a variety of reasons. They could do it voluntarily um, to pay off a debt if they didn't have the money. You could do it as a, as a sentence for a crime that you had committed. Um, there was just a lot of reasons that someone would become an indentured servant. So in the beginning, you know, like I said, when this country was a bunch of colonies, that was how they were doing it. Uh, and this was true for all races. Uh, black folks could be indentured servants. Whites uh, from Britain, Ireland uh, were indentured servants. And so it was basically, uh, it was not a race-based slavery and it was not a lifetime slavery. It was just this uh, this Bible-based uh, model of it, of service, indentured servitude. The problem that they ran into, though, was that uh, at that time, America had a frontier and America had a lot of unsettled land. And there was not very much uh, communication either between like various territories and towns. So what would happen is these indentured servants could just run away to another town and nobody would have any way of knowing that they were an indentured servant or that their period of service was not up yet. And so a lot of people were losing money. You know, the, the people who to whom the service was owed by these servants were, were losing a lot of their, their money and their years of service. So eventually, through a, a series of, you know, dirty deliberations, man, they concocted this scheme to basically uh, enslave Africans for life based on the fact that they wouldn't be able to run away because there was nothing that they could do to cover up, you know, their physical identity. And uh, also... Enslaving like the Irish or enslaving the French or some of these other groups uh, for life probably would have caused a political backlash with the Europeans and that would have damaged, um, you know, the global trade relationships and everything that we had with the Europeans back then. And they couldn't really afford to do that. But with the Africans, they didn't run that same risk. Uh, there were not governments back there that, you know, would... Uh, impose tariffs or, you know, refuse to trade with us or anything like that. It was kind of a more loose situation back there. You had the tribal chiefs and everything, but back in Africa, if you read the history of West Africa, like prior to the, the transatlantic slave trade, a lot of these people were already slaves back there to the chiefs. And now some of these African indentured servants had already become free and some of them had even become landowners. But um, from that point forward, they imposed lifetime slavery on the new 
African slaves. And um, it turned into the situation that, you know, it went down in history as one of the biggest crimes, obviously, against humanity in the history of uh, in the history of the world. But in order to do that, you know, at this time, uh, a lot of people in America were very religious and they were following Christianity. And the lifetime slavery thing was not, that didn't jive with the Bible. The Hebrew community, they had their six years of service um, idea that they that they did, but the lifetime slavery thing of one particular group of people was not, that, that wasn't like acceptable to a lot of uh, Christians. So they had to come up with a, a reason for it. And in order to do that, they kind of departed from the Bible. And they went to a more social Darwinistic, atheistic justification. And that was, it became like an ideological basis for white supremacy. And this basically was that whites were inherently superior to blacks. They said that, you know, whites were just meant to dominate blacks. And the evidence of this was that they had always done that. You know, that, that uh, just like the lions had always dominated the gazelles and the wolves always dominated the sheep. Whites being, you know, the, the predator and blacks being the prey, just superior by nature, they were just meant to do this. And this was just the natural order of things. And there was nothing that anybody could do about it. This was just the way things had been set up, or the way that evolution had, had uh, brought things to be. The problem with that is that that's not really historically accurate because in a lot of instances in history, you had these really powerful African empires that it's, at certain points had even dominated Europeans. So that narrative was not actually correct. And so a lot of that was just not mentioned or covered up and stuff like that. And there was a lot of twisting of history that went on. So black folks, you know, once they got, you know, the ability to read and they, they got their hands on a lot of these books and they got their hands on the Bible and some of these other books and they started to read like the history of Africa, the history of Europe, the history of the Middle East. And they found these instances where these African empires had been extremely powerful and had even dominated Europeans. They saw that, you know, the white supremacist narrative was not true. And so they would kind of gravitate towards these towards the cultures of these empires that had proven the white supremacists point to be incorrect. And one of the most famous examples of that was the Moors. Okay. So the Moors were an African empire that uh, ruled parts of Southern Europe from about the eighth century to about the 13th century. Uh, so we're talking about uh, about 700 years and they brought a lot of uh, culture and innovation to that portion of Southern Europe that they had dominated. Now, they also had a lot of influence in parts of Europe that they didn't rule over. Um, they were a force to be reckoned with uh, during the entire Middle Ages, really, in, in Europe. So who were the Moors? Stones and, you know, some of these gangs and some of these civil rights movements put placed a lot of importance on the fact that the Moors, at least some of them, were black. Now, the Moors were actually not just one race of people. The term Moor was actually a European slang term. Uh, at one particular point, it, it just was used to refer to any Muslims in general. But at that particular time in Europe, that would have referred to this one uh, group of Muslims that had conquered Europe. And they would refer to any Muslim that was in Europe as a Moor, even an Arab or Berber, even, even European converts were referred to as Moors. So that word, uh, it has a very long history. Um, but this was actually a multiracial, multi-ethnic group that was united under Islam. Sometimes the tribes within the Moors, because like I said, it was a multi-ethnic coalition, sometimes they didn't always get along. A lot of the Arabs and the Berbers would, or disagree with each other at, at various points um, because 700 years of history is a long time, obviously, and there was a lot of change of hands of the, of the, the rule of power during that time between these various groups. Uh, and if we go back to uh, the very beginning, I guess you could say about 10,000 B.C., uh, in the region around the Caucasus Mountains, as a lot of you guys know, a group of people emerged from that region. Uh, it's in Central Asia that uh, obviously became known as Caucasians. And they spread out in all directions. Some went to Europe, obviously, uh, and became the Europeans. Some went uh, into the Middle East. Some went uh, east into Asia. And some went west but south into North Africa. And uh, this was like a migration from Western Asia about 10,000 BC. Some of them, you know, they, they covered basically the, the entire uh, northern uh, fringe of Africa, if you could call it that, northern Egypt all the way to, uh, all the way over to Morocco. And they kind of 
changed over the centuries into multiple ethnic groups. And in the western part of Africa, in the what's called the Maghreb region, the Maghreb over by uh, Morocco, modern day Morocco, they became, uh, they started a culture, I guess you could say, uh, of people called the Berbers. Now that name Berber actually comes from uh, from the word barbarian, that, that was a term that, you know, it was given later, but a lot of them, they don't like that term. Uh, the term really that, the, that they use is Amazigh, the Amazigh people, A-M-A-Z-I-G-H. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, but um, that's the that's the term. And they, they just developed a distinct culture, a distinct language. This group didn't exist in only one country. Uh, I mean, these countries were kind of arbitrarily drawn up later, uh, much, much later. And so the, the region that the Berbers inhabit crosses the border of several countries uh, in the modern day. They're down in Niger. Uh, there's a group of Berbers down there, a tribe of Berbers called the Tuareg people, which are uh, mostly black. Uh, some of them are mixed, but I would say the majority of the Tuareg are, are what we would consider black. And then in the north, in, like I said, in the Maghreb region over, uh, over in Morocco, you have other tribes of Berbers that uh, look more Caucasian. So the Berbers are kind of like a multiracial group. A lot of them get mistaken for being Hispanic. Uh, some of them get mistaken for being Middle Eastern Arabs. Um, but they're a distinct ethnic group, man, that uh, you know, it was like a co kind of a combination of the Caucasians that migrated from Western Asia into that region and the black folks that were already there, indigenous to, to the region uh, before 10,000 BC. And they mixed together. And uh, a lot of Berbers now are mixed. Some look more 100% black, some look more 100% uh, Caucasian. So that's the situation with them. Uh, but they all really are considered kind of one people, even though they're divided up into tribes. Uh, it's all one culture, this Berber culture. And uh, like I said, they can be uh, a variety of phenotypes, I guess you could say. Asking what race the Berbers are is kind of like asking what race the Puerto Ricans are or something like that. It's like they're, they're a mixed people. So... The Berbers, you know, existed and they had their pagan religions and some of them uh, became Christian later when Christianity started. When Islam came along in the Middle East and uh, Muhammad and his followers united the tribes of Arabia, the, the Arabs, uh, the Arabs then invaded, uh, they embarked on a conquest of North Africa and they conquered Egypt from the Byzantines and then they pushed west uh, into, you know, the rest of North Africa and a lot of the uh, people in that region, including the Berbers, uh, the Amazigh people, they converted to Islam, many of them. Now, there are still some other religious minorities among them. Um, there's still some that are Christian, mainly Catholic. But um, I would say the majority of Berbers uh, today are, are Muslim, Sunni Muslim. So once the Arabs, you know, converted a lot of these Berbers to Islam, and actually not too long after they converted, they embarked then on a conquest together of uh, Southern Europe. Okay, now their main goal, according to uh, some of them, was eventually to, to get the city of Constantinople. Now the city of Constantinople is not anywhere near Morocco. That's all the way, it's right at the border of Greece and Turkey. Uh, it used to be part of Greece. It used to be like one of the main cities, like the center of, of the Byzantine Empire, but um, it eventually uh, did fall to the Turks in, in the 1400s. So. The Moors were never able to conquer Constantinople, but they had this idea that in order to get to Constantinople, the best way to do that would be to go through Western Europe and then conquer towards the east until they get to Constantinople. In the 700s, in the series of battles, the, uh, the Arabs and the Berbers clicked up together. They invaded southern Spain, and little by little, they conquered uh, most of the Iberian Peninsula. Now, they also, you know, had a huge influence in other parts of, uh, of Southern Europe, even though they didn't uh, have official rule over those, you know, parts of the Mediterranean. But, yeah, they ruled Spain then for about 700 years. Not really the entire country, but uh, most of the Iberian Peninsula. And they established kingdoms there. Uh, the, the caliphate that was in, in power at the time of their uh, conquering Spain was called the Umayyad Caliphate. The, the Arab world, the Muslim world, was ruled by a series of dynasties or empires called caliphates. Uh, the group ISIS actually today calls themselves the Caliphate, kind of harkening back to that time. But uh, yeah, the uh, the Umayyad Caliphate was one of the most powerful ones. And um, they, they heard, there were competitions between them and, you know, some of the other families and the other dynasties. And that's a whole other video, a long history, the 700-year history of the Moors ruling Spain. 
it's I mean that would take like literally hours and hours to to go through but um yeah, they left a, an impression and a mark on Southern Europe that endures till this day. You see a lot of uh, Spaniards, a lot of pe people in that uh, in that part of Europe that have even Arabic names to this day: Omar, Jamal, Jamar. Uh, these are Arabic names. Fatima is a common name amongst the uh, like Hispanic women even, even till today. And uh, th this all comes from the Moors. It comes from the Arabs. So the the term Moor uh, comes from it comes from the word Maori. Now that's one of the, it's the name of one of the uh, the tribes of Berbers, but the the root of that word is a Greek word. The, the Greek word uh, Mavro it means black, and in ancient in the ancient language it was pronounced Mauro. Uh, the pronunciation has changed over time, so that became like the root of the Spanish word Moro or Moreno. The the M O R uh, beginning it, it means like dark or black. And uh, the Europeans at this time, though, that term was kind of a term that referred to uh, the connotation associated with various people or events. So like the Black Plague, the Black Pirate, the Black Knight, when, when, when things were going bad, they would say it was a black day. It, it meant something negative, really. And the Europeans saw the Moors as invaders. They saw them as oppressors. Uh, they did enslave a lot of Europeans and, you know, they colonized that land. So, I mean, the, the Europeans were not really happy about that. And uh, eventually, you know, they kicked them out. So the, the Moors changed relations between Europe and Africa. Uh, for a long time because, uh, like I said, the, the, the Europeans saw them as, as occupiers, as invaders. And uh, that, you know, for the for the white supremacist narrative was like, a, it was like a contradiction, you know, because like I said, they their argument was that whites were meant to do dominate blacks and they had always done this and this was just the natural order of things. Well, here was a situation where that didn't happen. Now, a lot of you know people who are arguing this point would would counter that. Well, a lot of the Berbers were not black. A lot of them were were Caucasian Berbers. That was a mixed group, as it is even even till to this day. But some of them, I mean, they definitely had black folks with them. I mean, you can even see in some of the in some of the ancient uh, in some of the artwork, you know, in the the tribes in the south in the Niger region, they're definitely uh, predominantly black, even though they may be mixed. So uh, that provided like a now, now you see some pro-blacks here in the United States that take it to the opposite extreme and say that all the Moors were black, and that none of these, none of these white uh, Berbers or none of these white Amazigh people are are real Moors. I was reading a debate uh, about this one time, and there was a, a black lady who had explained the presence of these white Berbers uh, by the fact that the uh, the Moors had brought European slaves into North Africa, and that these these white people that are there now were the descendants of of those slaves, but that that's partly true. But at the same time, the archeological evidence and the genetic DNA evidence shows that there, those people were already there really thousands of years, at least a combination of both. Everybody in the Mediterranean, I'll say this, you know, like Morocco, it's, it's part of the Mediterranean, so is Spain. Everybody in the Mediterranean is mixed with everybody else in the Mediterranean. <laughs> Like if you if you see any DNA test from anybody from that region, I mean, you guys, for those of you guys who've already been on my channel for a while, you guys know I'm Mediterranean myself. In my DNA test, it, it looked like a bag of checks mix. I mean, you see every like Mediterranean, every other Mediterranean country in there. That that region of the world, it was like you know a cradle of civilization. It was a hot spot of trading of empires. You know, people conquering various countries, and there were so many different empires, so much mercantilism in that in that region of the world, so many people uh, going back and forth across the sea to different countries, that uh, it, there's nobody in that region that's like pure anything. I mean, nobody. I mean, you see like some of the people from Spain, they get North Africa in there big time. You, you see some of the North Africans, they get Spain in there big time. It's very close. Uh, people forget like a lot of times how close it really is. You see the Strait of Gib Gibraltar, it's literally like a hop, skip, and a jump. It easily facilitated a lot of mixing with, between these people. And you get all different type of uh, phenotypes, you know, and, and genotypes. You see them all over the place. You'll see people even in the same family that look like completely different because various genes express themselves. And my own family is no different. My sister, people mistake her for being like Mexican or Puerto Rican or that because she's like very, she had that very deep tan. And you guys see me, I'm like white as, white as a cloud. 
and this is within the same family, you know, same mom, same dad, same everything. So it's like uh, the, the genes over there are so diverse in that in that part of the world. And uh, the, the Tuareg people, the Amazigh people, it's the same thing. So anyways, the stones, you know, they um, they gravitated towards this group of people. Africans had been strong. It was a, it was a contradiction and a reputation to the white supremacist narrative. And the stones are not the only ones. Um, like I said, a lot of the a lot of the pro black movements, uh, even to this day, th there's people that call themselves the Moors, like like black guys that call themselves Moors and identify as Moors, like straight up. Um, and they wear a lot of the, the clothes that the Moors wore, the uh, the hats, you know, a lot of the a lot of the garments. Uh, they use a lot of the terminology. Uh, some of them practice Islam. For them, it, it's almost like making part of the religion, their, their ethnicity. There's a real ideological interweaving of ethnocentrism and, and the religion that that particular group of people held. When I, you know, talk to these guys, I, I like to ask them, like, if, if the Moors had been a different religion, would you be that religion? Like, do you genuinely believe that that religion is the truth? Or is it simply because, you know, this, uh, it's a source of ethnic pride that these people exist and that this was a religion that they held. So that's why, you know, I, I hold this particular religion. I have this debate with a lot of people because in that part of the world too, religion is closely identified with ethnicity. Um, and my own ethnic group is big time, like known for this. Uh, it's like, if you're, you know, born into this one particular ethnic group, you have to be this religion. And I asked them like, do you actually believe that this religion is true though? Because if you don't, you're really not that religion. You know, so it kind of contradicts the idea of what a religion really is. But that's a whole other video, though, man. But um, yeah, so even to this day, you see a lot of them. Um, they exist. You know, you, they've got the Moorish uh, organizations here all over the country, really, not just in uh, not just in this area. But the Stones, like I said, though, you know, they call themselves Mo, which is you know short for more. But the Stones today, the younger Stones growing up, they don't really. They're not as much into that as the older Stones. As a matter of fact. I, most of the stones that I know are like Christian or secular. Like I really don't know too many stones that are actually practicing Muslims, uh, especially from the younger generation, from the kids. Pfft, I, I don't know like any uh, that actually, you know, follow that. So it's right now it's really just a street gang. But um, yeah, the, the original stones though, they drew heavily on that Moorish culture and they, they basically modeled their whole organization after that. So yeah, but uh, shout out though to all the Amazigh people. If I have any Amazigh people in the in the in the comment section, they got a very rich culture and a, a very ancient history and a very interesting history because, like I said, they span several countries, and it's really a multiracial group. It's just interesting how like that one particular group, uh, you know, provided um, a, a source of motivation and a source of uh, well, it became a, an ideological curiosity for people that you know you had no connection to them at first you know now there's a, a culture and a, cultural and ideological connection but at first i mean you had the west africans that became you know victims of the transatlantic slave trade and then like literally 700 years after the fact um we're talking about this group in north africa called the moors um, because of how it related to the ideology that was being used to oppress them and so you never know how these things are gonna are gonna intertwine history is very interesting like that man your boy, when you see the report, I'm out.